Well, a very good evening to everybody that's tuning in. Happy Sunday. St. Patty's Day, Ross. It's time to be exciting, right? Did you uh, <laughs> did you get a parade on? Did you I did some carrot. I cabbage? did not. I, I saw the I saw the aftermath of the the parade in Baton Rouge, and I'm like, man, yeah. I'm like kind of glad I missed it. <laughs> I heard they didn't even throw food over there. I'm like, what are y'all doing? They do it though. <laughs> they do it for sure. Yeah. Like they're like, ah, Mardi Gras, like we got St. Patty's Day. They're ready. For yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> it's always a good time, though. I I just can't believe it's already come and gone. You know what I'm saying? Like we're already here, and Easter's in two weeks. Like, what what is what's going on? I don't Crazy. know. Maybe it's something like getting Crazy. older and stuff. It's like time you just don't feel different. like you have as much time. Yeah, it does. It really does. <laughs> and so some people can relate to that. Maybe not everybody. But anyways, I hope you're doing well, Ross. I hope you guys are out there doing well too. And and thank you for tuning in as always to Second and Saints. John Hendricks alongside Ross Jackson, if you haven't figured out who we are yet by now. But uh, at any rate, Ross, it's been, I guess you could say somewhat an anticlimactic uh, first week, not even a first week of, of for the Saints. We're not really that surprised, but I yeah. think tonight, one of the things we want to talk about is maybe talk some people off the ledge and understand that this is kind of the MMO. And if you've been following us, this has obviously been expected, but let's start with the good. I think when you look at this team and signing a player, Willie Gay Jr., man, I, I just we were on the Zoom with him. We got to hear about him. And if you haven't seen that interview, it's on Second and Saints. You can definitely check that out. But, man, he's got so much charisma and energy, yeah, yeah. and this guy just wants to come in and play football. I love the signing personally. I know you do. Talk a little bit about Willie Gay Jr., what he brings to the table, and what do you like about him most? Yeah, I think that the three things that you're looking to add to this New Orleans Saints second level, and we've been kind of talking about this for a couple of years, is that you want to add speed to the second level, you want to add youth to the second level, and you want to add playmaking ability to the second level. That was one of the things that was really nice about Pete Warner in 2023 is that you started seeing some of the playmaking ability come through over the course of the past couple of years. But boy, you want to talk about a playmaker already, like signed, sealed, delivered. That's who Willie Gay is. Mm -hmm. And he's somebody that plays a lot. Like when he was at... Uh, when he was in college, he played a little bit more of the weak side coverage linebacker, you know, 44640 coming out of the draft process and all that. But then when he got to the NFL, Kansas City didn't stick him in that will linebacker spot, the off ball coverage mm -hmm. linebacker spot. They had him play a lot more over on the strong side, crash down, defend the run, rush the passer, climb the line of scrimmage, all those types of things. And so he's a little bit of an all around guy now. And I think that's a perfect fit for the New Orleans Saints. You don't necessarily have like an open starting linebacker spot by any means. But if you've got somebody that can move around and shift around, it allows you to be a, a lot more versatile uh, in that level. Yeah, and I love the fact, too, that he did his homework, right? He said other teams yeah. were interested in him. He said he leaned a lot on Colin Saunders, and he knew that guys like Tyron were here, Tano, and even his college teammate, Jonathan Abram. I mean, right. like, the guy did his homework. And, look, he just wants to go out, and he doesn't want to be one of these guys that's just a 25-snap a guy, right? He wants to play right. a, a lot of football, and he's got the energy. I, I think one of the best things about him, one of the traits, and I don't think it's by chance, Ross, but – he is very good against mobile quarterbacks. And yes, I think yes, that's something good point. Yep. We know the Saints have had a problem in their fair share of struggles with, but look, this is a guy that's coming in. He's excited about Demario Davis. Obviously, he said he's watched a lot of film on Demario, been following he his said, career kind of since the eighth, right? <laughs> you know, since the eighth grade, I think is eighth, what he said. Eighth grade, yeah. That's <laughs> crazy, man. Like, I was I like, mean, wow. Like, like yeah. what, what, what phrase? a role model. You know, what praise to Demario Davis, but I know Demario also heard that and was like, did you have to say eighth grade, bro? Like, did you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're yeah. going to get some grief about that one, but, you know, in the, in, in, in all jest and in, in, in the best way possible. But it's cool. Like, you could tell he's going to fit in right away in that line. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and again, I think the energy and the fact that he has a lot to prove. And look, it's only a, a one year deal, but this guy's another one that's fresh off a Super Bowl win. I, I think he's again got something to prove to where he can maybe cash in on a bigger paycheck. But man, I, I just love that addition, you know, to this linebacker room. And of course, it is tough because you lost Zach Bond. You know, you right. know the outlook. They don't have a lot of linebackers on the roster right now. I think. You know, even with Pete and, and Demario in there, there's a little bit of concern. And, you know, you get a guy like him learning under a guy like Michael Hodges. I think the sky's the limit for him. And just a, a really solid signing by the team. He was obviously one of those top 100 players. And, of course, you can get wrapped up in the analytics. You can get wrapped up in pro football focus grades. You can get wrapped up in stuff. The guy just can play. And you watch his film. You see it on there. You see his ability to just be able to, to make such an impact. And again, for a guy that was only getting 20 to 25 snaps, now he's in a position where he can get even more. And so I, I really love the Willie Gage Jr. signing. I think they got extremely great value on this as far as the contract goes. Oh, man. I, I just I don't know that there's too much that you can look at and say, yeah, I don't really care too much about that deal. This is one that I think that they really nailed here. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the contract, too. I think this is an absolute steal. This reminds me of like a few years ago when they signed like Malcolm Brown uh, or when they brought in like Manti Teo, right? These were mm -hmm. like earlier, well, not, not Manti, but like Malcolm Brown in particular was an earlier free agent signing in terms of the free agency period uh, that got no, you know, pub, nobody paid attention to it. It was just, you know, a big defensive tackle. And then he ended up being this massively underrated signing Oops. for them that was, you know, big for them. We saw the same thing with Manti Teo when they signed him later on in, in the offseason. I think he was like right before camp or maybe right at camp or something like that. But then he ended up playing a big role for them too. The Kiko Alonso trade, like Kiko had, you know, a couple of good years or, or, or a good season with them as well. And so I, I think about like those signings that didn't cause – ripples across NFL media, national media, and stuff like that mm. when the signings happen, but ended up being integral players for them throughout the season. Not pro bowlers, not all pros. They didn't get the recognition, but they ended up playing a core role for the Saints. I could see that same thing happening with Willie Gay. And to get that on a one-year up to $5 million, I'm using air quotes on up to $5 million, which tends to – um imply that there are some incentives and stuff like mm -hmm. that, like performance incentives and things like that that might be attached to just a, a wild good contract when everyone was kind of expecting Willie Gay, two time Super Bowl champion, to walk away and, you know, out of his rookie contract to get seven to ten million dollars per year. I mean, just a steal for them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's funny you mentioned Malcolm Brown. I was on the the, the Saints Reddit, and yeah, I, I know I'm crazy. I actually have had some fun on there, but you know they actually had Malcolm Brown as one of those guys. And I'm like, one of the comments I said, it, it, somebody was like, I don't know to remember too much about him. Said the Saints run defense got so much better when Malcolm Brown was there, and when 100%. he was gone, it it tanked hard. Yeah, so, uh, those types of signings they don't make a huge bunch of waves, but I really do like that that he comes in. Guys, if y'all have questions, please be sure to drop them. I, I just want to yeah. segue here because now that they have Willie Gay Jr. in the mix, they got DeMario, they got Pete Warner. We know Nephi Sewell's on. It's going to be delayed. He's not going to be ready for the start of training camp. You got De DeMarco Jackson. You're still needing a lot of players on here. So is linebacker still in play for the draft? Asked Paul, the Saints fan. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, the, the way that I look at it is that like by the time you get to the draft, the position goes away. Right. Like ideally, ideally, that's the situation is that position kind of goes away. And so you don't want to draft somebody that is a lesser talent at a certain draft position because of their position, nor do you want to pass on somebody that's really, really good at a certain draft area because of their position. So, you know, my favorite linebacker or my top linebacker, I should say, in this year's class is Peyton Wilson, the, the linebacker yes. out of uh, out of North Carolina, out of NC State. Outstanding. We have to see Very him much. at the senior bowl as well. Mm -hmm. uh, or senior bowl practices, um, if he's there at 45 and he's the best player on the board, I don't think you pass on him just because he's a linebacker, right? Yeah. And so I think that's the way that I kind of look at it. I would say that for every position up and down the board. Maybe quarterback you can be a little bit more picky about, particularly in the first round or something like that. But when it comes down to where you are, just because teams tend to not overinvest at that position when they need to fill around their quarterbacks in order to win games – I just think that all those other spots, like you don't pass on it just because of the position. So I would say, yeah, it's still in play, but I don't think they're going to walk into the draft going, we got to get a linebacker. 
Yeah, I agree. And because I, I think when you look at it, and you, of course, look, they've got four fifth round picks right now. One of those is probably going to be a linebacker. I'm just telling you, right? Right. They're yeah. going to add undrafted guys because they got to backfill their special teams. They've lost a lot of pieces special there teams, on special yeah. teams. My goodness, it's it's bad. And we'll get in kind of those losses here in a minute. But I, I do, I am of the belief. I think you do have to draft the linebacker. And we've talked about it previously. We said, is this the year that you look at a Demario replacement? And look, I think Demario, obviously, with the way they reconstructed the contracts with him and Tyron, it's two more years of those guys. And, and I think that that's really kind of the, the vision there. I don't think they're saying, well, you know, we got him for two years. Let's go ahead and draft his replacement now. That might be maybe a next year question potentially, yeah. but I love Peyton Wilson. I think he's outstanding. I think he's, he's a guy that can come in and just change everything for whatever team drafts him. And so I think, of course, you're still there's still plenty of linebackers out there that you can sign, but yeah. and of course there's some you can sign of your own, resign, and and then obviously in the draft, getting young at that position, you know, a guy like Demarco Jackson, he's not making a ton of waves, but he's a solid special teams player, and now he's going to be in a, a a role where he's going to be even more important. And you know, mm -hmm. you look at things like the Carolina Panthers game where he recovers that onside kick, right. he doesn't do that. I mean, that's a lot of trust in a young player. I mean they have the right coach right now with Michael Hodges. And of course we've talked about it, that potentially he's going to be a guy that's going to get a lot more interest after this year, I feel like. And so, you know, he may not be in a, the, a future plans for him, but I love the the concept of drafting a linebacker. They have a whole bunch of picks. One of them has to be a linebacker just for the sheer numbers of special teams and the things that you have to get. And so they'll, they'll get one. I just don't know if it's going to be 45 because the way right. things have played out in free agency so far, I mean, if we're looking at current needs, I think there's a probably more pressing needs to address at 14 and 45, but yeah, I, agree. I, I love the linebacker spot. I love that. And so when you look at the, the rest of the moves that they've had, nothing that sets the world on fire, right? Like Nathan yeah. Peterman signing Cedric Wilson, Stanley. Well, Morgan the Jr. Nathan, the Nathan Peterman signing set the world on fire, but it was, it was <laughs> not the greatest. Reasons. Maybe not in the way. Now here's what <laughs> I would say. And, and we can talk about it, but mm -hmm. you know, look, Cedric Wilson, I, I like that signing. He's a guy. Cedric that Wilson. Really I like, yeah, I like Dallas that signing Dallas. a lot. Stanley Morgan is a local kid from St. All. You know, he's a more of a core special teams guy. Yep. You got to fill out your 90 man roster and he's going to compete there. Um, but Nathan Peterman, especially with the talk about Justin Fields going for a six and all these quarterbacks that got traded, like I, I tweeted out, it was, it was all those quarterbacks that got traded before Justin Fields. It was Sam Howell. It was Mac Jones. It was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, Pickett, uh, yeah. Pickett, all those guys. And like, and then Pittsburgh gets him for a six rounder, you know, and I get it. I understand because hindsight's 2020, but. Nathan Peterman's a guy that's been in a system with Andrew Janako. And so he, he obviously, Maybe would have got the glaring endorsement, but also with the Fields argument, maybe if Janako trusted a lot more in Fields, maybe he would have pushed the Saints to trade for him or stuff. We'll never know, I guess. But Nathan Peterman was Derek Carr's backup when he was with the Raiders, so there's obviously some familiarity there. But this is, in essence, Jake Hayner's role, right? The backup should be Jake Hayner. That's, I think, the main takeaway here. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And look, Nathan Peterman's going to, you know, compete and all these other things. Uh, I've been very clear on on my opinions on Nathan Peterman. You're talking about the guy with the the active the 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 lowest passer rating amongst all active quarterbacks with at least 100 passes attempted. This is not a guy that you sign and bring in because you want to get him out on the field. This is a guy that you sign and bring in because he's got familiarity with your quarterback, he's got familiarity with your quarterback coach, and then maybe he makes a 53 man roster, right? Like maybe that's the case. Maybe that's not like he's really kind of, it feels like he's really just kind of here to help with the transition into the new offense and all these other things and having familiarity with these two newcomers to help bridge that gap and all those other things. Like I get all that. The other things, the Justin Fields conversation, by the way, is that Justin Fields wanted to go to Pittsburgh. And one of the things yeah. that Ryan Poles said at, during the combine very out loud is that their number one sort of priority when it came to Justin Fields, if they did indeed trade him, which was always, it felt like it was always going to be the case. But if they did indeed trade him was to do right by Justin Fields. And so yeah. they traded him before the, the fifth year option date uh, expiration. That way the team that he went to can make the decision on picking up the fifth year option. That's solid for Justin Fields. They didn't draw it out. They had him land with a team that he wanted to go to. He, they had him land, uh, you know, he wanted to work with Russell Wilson, I imagine, and like Tomlin and all these other guys. They did right by Justin Fields. So even if the Saints were in on Justin Fields, that's not where Justin Fields wanted to go. And that's not where the Bears were going to trade him. So I think that that's a, a good part of the story, too. 
is that the Bears did right by Justin Fields, which meant that even if the Saints were interested, he was never going to end up here. Yeah, and let's not forget about the elephant in the room. We've been telling you before, this team's committed to Derek Carr, whether you like it or not. This is his team. There's no going to be no quarterback controversy. He's going to be the starter this year. He's probably going to be the starter next year unless something absolutely crazy happens. And so there's also that. And look, I, I think when you look at, and I'm saying this very, very prematurely, but when you shape out a 53 man roster, that's one of those moves where Nathan Peterman is a guy that you could release and nobody's going to try to pick him up. He can right. come back to the practice squad. They could do that for numbers. And I'm getting way ahead of myself, but the world's <laughs> not going to be set on fire by somebody running and saying, Oh man, Nathan, Nathan Peterman's, you know, with all respect to him, because he's been around in the league for a long time. Right? Sure. But yeah. That's just one of those things where if you look at how it's set up and they could still add, but you know, we've talked about it. I don't think they were, they were ever in that conversation of drafting a quarterback. I know people were heartbroken about that because of Jane Daniels, all this other stuff. We never have believe, believed it. And of course it could still happen, but, I just don't see it. No, I haven't no. seen it for a while. I just don't think like I get it. You want to build around a quarterback. You want to have him learn all this fun stuff. But this is just still not the year where you draft a quarterback. It just yeah. isn't. And so, you know, that's not a, a one of those signings that you just say, oh, man, it's it's a it's a real big, big front office move. Again, you know, Stanley Morgan Jr. Again, great, great story a local kid, a guy that's Mm -hmm. been on the practice squad for the Bengals for, you know, since 2019, you don't just hang around by chance. I think that you look at special teams, obviously it's going to matter because you've lost Isaac Yadam. You've Mm -hmm. lost Zach Bond, Lonnie Johnson, Jr. You're losing uh, uh, Malcolm Roach now and stuff. I mean, there are some major pieces to backfill here now that they've lost a lot of these players. And so some of these signings, you had to build out a 90 man roster, but it's also not necessarily about what we, can see visually on the surface yeah and i think oftentimes there's a misconception that because the saints were were working on getting a contract done with stanley morgan jr that they that they were not allocating their resources to negotiating contracts with other free agents and that's not necessarily true like you're normally talking to several players at a time you've got different people that will handle different things sometimes and all that like this is a just as much as it's a team game front office is a team game too and so it's not a situation to where it's like oh if the saints wouldn't have been working on a contract with nathan peterman then maybe they would have been able to trade for Denell hunter yeah. like those two those are conversations that can happen at the same time if there's interest there and all those other pieces so yeah i think that stanley morgan Juniors actually like he was a guy that I really liked coming out of Nebraska in his yes um, we all did yeah yeah oh yeah 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 I think we all kind of had him on our radar yeah. at that point as like a late round pick and all these other things a potential priority free agent and he was you know a guy that you looked at because of his special teams value and all that stuff I don't think you're really looking at him to come in and compete as a wide receiver we're talking about a guy that's got five career catches because he's been you know stockpiled behind Jamar Chase and T Higgins and Tyler Boyd and CJ Uzama and Joe Mixon and like you know all this this great you know Cincinnati Bengals offense at least well it was for a little while but anyway and so you know I think that what you're what you highlighted about him being a gunner or coming in to compete on a special yeah. teams capacity makes a ton of sense because that's that's the next thing that you're looking to bring and so even though you're signing somebody that has a position designation of wide receiver looking at the receiving statistics doesn't really cover the reason that you go out and sign him if you're the Saints. yeah and again it's one of those it's probably a low risk uh, you know high reward type situation i mean they signed brian edwards last year and people are like oh man he was with Derek carl and stuff he he tanked hard (laughs) yeah didn't even know who the wide receiver coach was that that was really really rough yeah, I didn't know who Cody Burns was. Oh, man, that was a tough look. But I don't know. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, I think of the free agents, we'll get to the ones that they've lost a lot. I, I do want to tackle this question because I've seen this a lot on social media. Um, but Deuce asked, do you think we're heading to a rebuild? Because I've seen this has suggested the way they've approached the free agency. And also we can use this as well from Randy is that we think we're done in free agency. Short answer is no. But does this suggest that this is a soft rebuild? Does this suggest that maybe the Saints aren't just doing this because, or what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I know I'm into this conversation because I, I, I wonder, <laughs> I, I wonder if, if we agree or disagree on this. Um, mm. I think it's a soft rebuild for them. 
And I don't think okay. that that's a bad thing. I think it's a soft rebuild for the middle of their roster is the big thing. Mm. I think they're very it, happy with what they're going to field in terms of their 22, right? 11 and 11. Yeah. They're, they're happy in terms of like what their starters can be. Maybe one signing or draft pick or something like that ends up kind of, you know, intruding into that and maybe upsetting something in a good way, right? Challenging and then, mm. and then winning a spot. But I, I think that this right here, this offseason has been a little bit of an opportunity for them to A, get their salary cap situation in a different uh, space, right? Allowing Andrews Pete to hit the market, taking on that dead cap hit, uh, not having so far restructured or touch the contracts of guys like um, Alvin Kamara or Taysom Hill. I don't, and then, uh, and Jawan Johnson's another one that hasn't been touched. He's got like a five and a half million dollar base salary. You could do some stuff with, uh, but they haven't like rushed to do all that. And so I look at that. I look at the, the weather, the the attrition is on purpose or whether the attrition is just simply and, and i have my theories around the losses we'll get to that in a second but you look at the fact that like a lot of the middle the people that are leaving are guys that were depth pieces middle of the roster types here's an opportunity for you to rebuild that now you have to be able to do that effectively uh but i do think that there is something to that and then using the draft to continue to build but build towards your future Right. And then be able to, you know, bring in an influx of young talent and all that kind of stuff. So I, I do think that there is a little bit of a soft rebuild that's happening, but I don't think that it's a rebuild in terms of, you know, tearing everything down to the studs and trying to rebuild it back up, Carolina Panthers style or anything like that. It's just working with what you've lost, working with what you need to add, and then figuring out the right ways to maybe bring in some new fresh perspectives and things like that, just like they did entirely in the offensive side when it comes to the coaching staff, which is another reason why I mentioned the soft rebuild, by the way, because mm -hmm. when you have a new coaching staff come in, they want a different type of player than your previous coaching staff. So it gives you an opportunity to kind of rebuild in that way too. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the truth of it all is if they were to play a game right now, you could put 22 starters out there. Even yeah. with the offensive line, I, I am just saying in theory because I know Ramcheck is dealing with his thing. He's right. he's yeah. going to be ready for ran, uh, training camp and stuff. But the fact is, you have a starting offensive line, you have a starting quarterback, you have your running back committee, you have your wide receivers, you have your tight ends. I mean, I think there's an area where they can get better at, obviously. But sure. you look defensively; they got their front four, they got their linebackers, they got their corners, they got their their safeties. I mean, there's nowhere on the roster that you could say they really don't have a starter there. I guess you could, is what I would tell you yep. now, yep. whether that's a, a guy that you agree with, like if you say, well, Trevor Penny shouldn't be the left tackle or James Hurst shouldn't be left guard, for instance, you yeah. know, yeah. those you are ways upgrade you can get starters a, for sure. Yeah, you definitely but can. You, you definitely it. should. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So you have that. And so that middle part of the roster, I think is where they look and look, you know, they wanted to try to get something done with Lonnie Johnson Jr., but mm -hmm. Lonnie got more money from Houston. I mean, that's that's one of those things. It's like we've kind of got a vision here, and maybe we don't take so many of those types of deals. And and so, I mean, I look at what they signed Colin Saunders and, and Nathan Shepard last offseason. Those were really pretty good, solid deals for interior mm -hmm. guys who've been around the league for a while. And I know that they're not trying to spend top dollar and they're not trying to play in that top tier they were never. And of course, if you've been following us or you've been hearing, you've been seeing all of us, right? We've been knowing that. And so I think that you look at some of these other free agents, they're not going to set the world on fire. Now, it needs to to pay off, right? If you're if that's the vision that you're not going to try to build through free agency, you better hit on these draft picks and you better not mm -hmm. sit here and say, well, we're just going to come away. We have nine picks, but now we're going to only use like three or four of them. And then some of these are throwaways on like a quarterback you don't need or a, a position you just don't need. I, I think we've kind of touched on it, but tight end, it, their market for a tight end is not good right now for free right. agents. Um, Besides maybe Logan Thomas, maybe is, is if you mm -hmm. look at his way, but I mean, we talked about it. They could draft a tight end. Oh yeah. There are things that they could do. They haven't found a, a, like that top tier receiver. We feel like Hunter Renfro might be an option, right? We mm -hmm. threw out Odell Beckham Jr. last week. Then, you know, right. Mike Williams came available. I mean, there are options that could fit down the line, but the saints are just in this space right now where, you know, they're kind of quiet. They haven't set the world on fire, but again, like we've urged you before, be a little bit patient. I think what's hurt them is is some of the losses though because it does yeah. hurt to lose Lonnie Johnson Jr. because and for all intents and purposes, this is a guy that was starting for you when Marcus May was hurt. 
Um, mm-hmm. Even when Jordan Howden came in, you know, it, they gave a little bit of nod to, to Lonnie there and with Zach Bond. You don't have that prototypical guy that can come in and rush the passer like Zach Bond can. And Malcolm Roach, solid interior run defender, tons of energy in the locker room. I think that's one of the ones that they're going to miss a lot right now. And that's a position that they've really got to look at on the interior. And then, you know, yet him. I mean, he was a solid special teams guy, a gunner. Uh, a guy that can start. He was top 10 in the league in pass breakups. I mean, the guys they've lost are not just players, you know? And then of course, Jameis, a solid backup that you had too. Right. And with upside starting potential, I mean, these are guys that you lose it. It sucks because it's a business, but they've lost some guys that are going to hurt them if they don't try to backfill or get somebody that's going to be able to play up to that level. Yeah. And I think sometimes we have to remember opportunity, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you think about a guy like Isaac Yadam heading over to San Francisco, one of their starting corners, Ambry Thomas, he's an upgrade over Ambry Thomas. He's a guy that can start in San Francisco. He wasn't, he, at least at this time, there was no clear path to him being a starter in New Orleans. So role versus role, opportunity versus opportunity, Saints lose in that situation because you're bringing Mm -hmm. back a depth piece or a special teamer here. He's going to get a starting opportunity over in San Francisco. Similarly with Zach Bond, playing a role here, playing a role in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the better landing spot for him. Malcolm Roach, two-year deal. He's probably going to be a starter over there as opposed to as much of a rotational guy here in New Orleans. Opportunity versus opportunity. And the Saints, every time so far, have provided the lesser opportunity, not because they're making bad decisions or the wrong decision. They just have starters at those positions, and there's not really a way to work your way in there. So what they have to offer probably didn't measure to the opportunities. This reminds me of Caden Ellis last year. They wanted to keep Caden Ellis, but their role would have been a rotational depth linebacker. The role that was offered to him in Atlanta with Ryan Nielsen was a starting role and he got that starting role. So I think that that's, that's a big thing. Now, the, the other piece of this conversation to me that's really interesting, John, is that we, we discuss a little bit about a lot about the, like the, the why, the mentality behind the decisions, what we think they're thinking and all these other things. But it's not to say that they're making the right decisions. It's not to say that they're making the wrong decisions. Like that's something that we won't really know until like this time next year. <laughs> so yeah, there's not right. really a way to look at this and go, that was the right choice. That was the yeah. wrong choice. It's more about like, here's what we think the mentality is, the thinking is, and all those stuff. And then they have to prove that they made the right choices on the field in 2024. So it's just a, an interesting conversation that you have to look at like the now, but then also be ready for what does the future tell you about the positions or sorry, not the positions, the decisions that they're making now. Yeah. And I was looking at a team like the Panthers. I'm like, you, you know, I, I I'm put it out there. I'm like, they do realize they got to have defense, right? They got to play defense too, because they were loading up on all these offensive ones. They had so much, you know, they had Brian Burns, Gross Matos. They had, uh, you know, Jeremy Chin, all these guys, Von mm-hmm. Bell, they mm-hmm. lost a ton. Luvu was another one. And then, they started signing more. I was like, okay, well, maybe they're a little bit, Nate, they, they actually know maybe a fraction of what they're doing and stuff. But, <laughs> you know, again, we, we always say it, it doesn't matter what you do here because nobody's assured anything when it comes to the playoffs. It's just right. it's too many times you get wrapped up and here's all the moves that are made in, in March and free agency. And man, this team had the best free agency on paper. They're absolutely going to be the Super Bowl champions. And it mm-hmm. just doesn't happen. It really doesn't. Now, you look at the saints and of course I think it is, it's one of those that, you know, if you're not going to go with Alani Johnson jr, I know they believe a lot in Jordan Howden. That's one of the mm-hmm. other reasons they move off Marcus may too. Not only because of the injuries, they love Jordan Howden. Yep. They love the upside that he brings to the table, you know, defensive tackle, you know, Brian Brzee is, is a prime example. He's playing extremely well, I think. And he's somebody that you got to get more in the rotation too. And if you get another person, alongside of him that's going to only do really good things for you and so i think you look at those that they there are believe it or not things that they've thought out in this aspect i know it's hard to believe sometimes but you know it has to pay dividends because this is a pivotal year for dennis allen it's a pivotal year for Derek carr they've got to produce they've got to be a winner and the pressure's on because the nfc south has gotten a lot better Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways atlanta is a lot better tampa you know, again, bringing back Baker Mayfield and Mike Evans is the best decision they could probably make. And to get yep. Levante David back. I mean, yep. I love and this guy. Field. I think he's, yeah. I mean, there's just so many different ones in, you know, Carolina. Now it seems like they're starting to play in a little bit bigger of a space. And so the saints, it's, it's really going to be important for them to kind of make sure that they maximize this. And there's, 
tons of free agents still available. They oh, can yeah. still sign players, believe it or not. There are still, like I was, I'm writing about this right now. There's still at least 30 players that are in the top 101 of the NFL network that they have out there. And so there are some that you just look at. I mean, there's tons of offensive linemen. There's tons of receivers available. There's so many different ones. Pass rushers, which kind of segues, segues me to this next question. The latest on Chase Young is he's still, mm-hmm. still scheduled to visit. Now, he was supposed to visit on Friday. It got rescheduled. Now, most people are like, oh, well, that means Tennessee is going to do this. We saw Carolina already sign their pass rushers, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't think they're in the, the race. Tennessee is one of those things. Is this a big deal to make about Chase Young rescheduling a visit? And we don't know much about when he's going to come or where he's going to come back or if he's even going to come back. Yeah. Or is it is it not a big deal? Yeah. Without more information, it's certainly not great, (laughs) right? (laughs) Like you can sit, you can sit back and you can go, okay, well, what are the reasons that it would be rescheduled? And, and look, there's personal reasons they get rescheduled. There's travel, there was storms, there was all these other things. Like I was traveling this weekend. It was a little rough. And so like, you look at all these like certain little pieces and things like that, that could potentially come in. Yeah. Okay. There's possibilities, but look, I, I get it. Like I understand concern around there. One of the things that is really interesting though, and, and, and I'm not saying that the saints did this, but I've seen this happen in the NFL before. So the Saints and the Titans were left on the uh, the visit list for Chase Young. Like you mentioned, he had visited Carolina. It looks like Carolina's moved on from that with their two signings over there. So the thing that you're watching is now, did the Saints reschedule so that they're now after the Tennessee Titans, which is something we see NFL teams do. Oh, go over there and visit with that team or those teams that we feel confident will will be ahead of in your consideration. Go ahead, go and visit with them, but come and finish up with us because this is where you're going to stay anyway. Like having that kind of attitude around like, no, no, go and do what you want to do. We're here and everything does have a negotiating impact on players. And it does open up because one of the things that I was saying was, hey, when that visit was on Friday, don't expect Chase Young to not leave without a contract. That's one of the things that people love to say. I wouldn't let him leave the facility without a contract. If he's got another visit scheduled, he's leaving the facility without a contract. But if the Saints reschedule to after Tennessee so that he goes to Nashville and then comes here to New Orleans, it gives him an opportunity to be able to say, okay, so tell us about your other visits. How do we, and then, and then you end up orchestrating something that maybe tries to come out on top of that. So it could be a strategic play by the saints. It depends on who rescheduled, but you know, sometimes it's that the reschedule never happens. Sometimes it's the reschedules on per, you know, personal things and stuff like that. So it's hard to know which way it goes right now, but there's definitely possibilities that go into a good scenario and a worst case scenario. And, you know, both, both are absolutely on the table in the situation. Yeah, and this is a guy who's super young still. He's 24. I mean, this right. is a guy that, uh, in a lot of ways, I think what you're looking at, you know, now that the the top of this market is kind of settled, now I think you're starting to going to start seeing a lot more of these one to two year deals, especially yeah. one year deals on a player with all the incentives built in. And with Chase Young, look, he's a guy that it didn't work out in Washington, San Francisco. We talked about it last week. There's just times where he doesn't look like he's a guy that's going to give you 100% for a full 60 minutes, you know, in some aspects. And so hopefully that's something he can figure out. Like he's talented as everything. I mean, he yeah. has the it factor and he needs to go to a situation where he's going to be able to be maximized. And of course you look at New Orleans and their edge position. I mean, you know, you're still kind of uncertain a little bit with Peyton Turner, Isaiah Foskey's facing a, a really big year, obviously. And then you got Cam and Carl Granderson and Tano. I mean, they have, defensive ends on the roster if you add somebody like a chase young you know then you think who's the the odd man out what's going to happen with you know a peyton turner what's going to happen with a foskey what's going to happen with the tano you know and and i think those are things to obviously consider too but the saints do want to try to get a pass rusher and so it is going to be one of those that they they have to look at and and see and i think with chase young it's again an unbelievable talent just like Mm -hmm. a jadavian clowny yeah, no I just hope that at this point in his career, seeing what has happened, you're going to go to a situation where you're trying to really cash in, first of all, and then be that you're going to show up and and do what you're supposed to do day after day and put forth your best film out there on, on tape to maybe get that big payday. But I don't think you're going to get that big payday from the Saints. I think the Titans, right. they may try to they say two or three years and we'll pay this, but the market for a pass rusher. We've seen these guys get paid. I mean, Daniel Hunter, I know he was a pipe dream of ours, but 
man, he got some pretty stupid money oh, from the taxes, good, and man. deservedly so. Yes, yes deservedly yes. so. But man, it was just kind of crazy uh, about how it all came up. But you know, we'll see because free agency isn't over. It's not nope. like this past week. It continues all the way. This team signed Lynn Bowden in, in June. They added Jimmy Graham in June. You know, Foster Moreau was a late ad. So those types of moves can still happen. I think you got other guys, again, maybe not to, you know too much, but wild cards. I don't think Justin Simmons is in a hurry to sign anywhere. I think mm-hmm. Kyle Van Noy is another guy that you might look at, a Calais mm-hmm. Campbell. Those are guys that aren't going to say i need to sign somebody right now right they can wait and they can wait till may or june and then be ready for training camp i mean i think that's a bit possible i i kind of like some of those guys that i mentioned yeah yeah i think that's happening more and more yeah yeah i mean we saw Mm -hmm. that with i mean i i i'll mention it but you know i think i know it's a different scenario situation but like we saw that with tyron right uh tyron Mm -hmm. waiting to sign jarvis landry waited to sign and Mm -hmm. Sue like didn't even he was just like all right who's making the playoffs y'all call me y'all call me when that happens you know what i mean like we've seen like those types of signings too like that's the kind of stuff that makes a lot of sense for some of these older like veteran players and stuff like that and then you know it's the younger guys that are trying to get out ahead that are trying to get the next contract and things like that because sometimes it's not about who you are it's about when you sign and everything we saw that with daniel jones for instance that's a bad example but you know at the quarterback position that's always the case and all but you know i think that there's those things one guy that i really like is uh is Tyus Bowser the the pass mm. rusher from the Baltimore Ravens? They moved off him, saved like over five million dollars on the salary cap. So he's somebody that doesn't factor into compensatory selections because they 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 cut him, like they moved on from him, and so he doesn't factor into the compensatory formula. All these other things. So like that's a good option for you. That's a guy that could sign earlier, right? He's not worried about not letting a comp pick get to his team and all these other things. Ah, oh, wait till after. But then also there's a lot of these guys that will wait till after the draft because they want to know what opportunities are actually open so they don't get Adrian Peterson. You know what I mean? So you <laughs> sign with the team and then they draft your position and then they end up moving on from you and all these other things. Like you don't want that to happen. And so it's it's one of those weird things with free agency happening before the draft uh, that you know ends up having a big impact. Yeah, absolutely. And so We'll see. Uh, again, stay the course. That's the biggest thing I'd preach is don't get too wrapped up. They're going to f- sign right. more pl- people. They're going to bring in more players. I think them being linked to Chase Young, I mean, they've been linked to high-profile guys over the years. I mean, he's one of them. I mean, Odell Beckham Jr. is another one that they've been linked to in the past. Mm-hmm. Davian Clowney, I mean, it's not for a lack of trying and that people just don't want to come to New Orleans. I mean, being linked to a guy like Chase Young is a pretty big deal. And, and so – We'll just have to wait and see and see what happens. And ultimately, you know, if he chooses the wrong team, he chooses the wrong team. And and hopefully that's not New Orleans. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's you can't fully say until we're at this point next year. Yeah. I do want to touch on this one, too. And we got another question that the, the Marshawn stuff is coming up again. Uh-huh. Adam is going to the 49ers for a better situation, like you mentioned before. People still are under the impression that Marshawn could be traded. We've talked about it on here. Um, We don't think it's happening. We think that the fences need to be mended there a little bit. And even if they did try to trade Marshawn, Alante could be an option to go outside too. Um, But this seems to come up. But I think with Yadam going somewhere else, it makes keeping Marshawn that much more important for this team. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I don't, I don't think that the Saints should trade Marshawn Lattimore. You pick 14th, so you might be able to like luck yourself into a, another very good corner in this year's class and all that, especially with early runs expected at offensive tackle quarterback and wide receiver. You'll see some of those other positions fall down, but don't create a need to then spend your first round pick to fill that need. Right. And yeah. so I think that that's, that's a big you know thing, but uh, you know, I think that holding on to Marshall and Lattimore is the best possible or the best case scenario for New Orleans. Should they be able to mend whatever, you know, you mentioned mending the fence, like mending whatever that break is. I think that that should be the priority first. And then if things just get to a place where you can't do that, then yeah, I, I, I like it's a bad choice. It's a crappy situation. It's something that no team would want to be a part of or be stuck with, including the New Orleans Saints uh, or like stuck doing like having to trade him away. But if you have to, you have to. Uh, but that's that's kind of on the on the organization to be able to kind of like get this where it needs to be. So I, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Marshawn Lattimore still in New Orleans in 2024. 
uh, as more time passes. And especially as you see the attrition from the Saints roster, it, it just makes more and more sense to keep them. Uh, so that that's, I, I, yeah, I'm in lockstep with you on that. I, I don't see the value in it. Uh, it would have to be a situation to where there's a fray and and that's what leads to the decision as opposed to, oh, is this good business practice, right? Is this yeah. good roster building? Is this good team building? The answer to those questions, in my opinion, is no. Yeah, and D- DJ asked the question, what if they trade him and move up in the draft? I, I don't think you're going to get as high of a of a, a price tag for Marshawn as, as people may think. You're not getting a first-round pick for Marshawn. I just don't think it. I mean, it's just saying – the the you know we talk about the injuries aren't his fault but if i'm a team looking at it, the injuries are a, a concern right it's a negotiating you're piece pay top, <laughs> it is a part of it and it's a negotiation yeah. and and obviously you're gonna have to take on that contract too and so there are more factors than just being like well i just want to trade this player i mean you got to look at that from a team perspective whoever's going to try to acquire him there probably will be conversations at some point if things don't get you know mended between them and and, and look they're gonna they're that's what the goal is. They would rather keep a guy like Marshawn Lattimore on the roster because they mm-hmm. still believe that he's a very good player for them. It's just, again, you look at the past couple of seasons, we mentioned this plenty. And we're going to keep saying this again. You keep losing football games when you're used to winning them for three straight years. I don't know that I would be too happy either. You know what right, I mean? That's sure. part of it. I just, I just think there's just too many – variables there and and again this is why it's so important for da and and Derek carr i say those two because they have a huge hand in it they gotta get it right because defensively i feel the pieces are there you've made the moves on the offensive staff to to at least try to better yourself right you're not doing the same thing you have been doing in in a lot of ways and so a lot hinges on on car a lot hinges on this defense being able to kind of i don't want to say pick up from where they left off but they got to go out and prove that they are still a top flight defense, which I think yeah. they're capable of. And so it, it's, it's there, right? It's there for them to be able to do. And I just don't see that trading a guy like Marshawn, unless things are just absolutely a hell in a handbasket that that's, that's just on the table right now. I just don't yeah. see it. Yeah. And I also don't even know that you're really in a position to trade Marshawn Lattimore for draft capital this year. It feels like you kind of have to wait until after June 1st to trade them because you need to defer that dead money instead of having it all accelerate into this year if you trade them away. Now, it depends on the terms of the agreement and things like that. Like you could sit there and say, okay, we'll take on some of this money and like you can get nifty with it. But the more that you do that, the lower your return becomes because that that organization is picking up extra pieces and all these other things. And so uh, like I don't even think that you can make a move that impacts this year's draft that involves Marshall Lattimore at least not fiscally, I don't think. Um, I mean, I guess you can make anything work. But again, the, the more that you play those little money games, the the lesser and lesser your return becomes uh, for that player from the team that's trading for him. So it feels like you'd have to wait until after June 1st because you can't do a post-June 1 trade and like designate it for later. You have to you have to actually wait until after June 1 to do any of those other things, which then allows you the deferment on the salary cap and all these other sort of like mechanics and things like that that help teams out. Um, I just it doesn't seem likely that you're going to be able to do that there. So it feels like if a trade is going to happen, kind of feels like it's going to happen like June two through that week before the season starts when that bonus is supposed that option bonus is supposed to kick in for him. Uh, and unless I'm understanding things incorrectly, it just doesn't feel likely that you're going to make any kind of move with him that's going to impact your draft this year. No, nah, I don't think so. I, I just don't see it. I, I really don't. And of course, people are going to continue to do that. I mean. I got on my soapbox last year, last week about everything, but I keep seeing this fake image of Michael Thomas signing with the Falcons. It hasn't happened. It's not happening. Really? Right I haven't now. even seen that. Oh, that, oh my gosh, it's all over. That that's out like there. I, I'm looking at you, Facebook. There's the most gullible oh, people out there that just start stuff. I mean, it is that's bad. Wild. And I'm like, come on, guys, be smarter than that. that? I mean, you know, anybody can create these images and make it look good. I mean, even on X, Twitter, I don't want to call it X because it's it's not X. It, it, they, <laughs> you can get these accounts that pay for blue check mark. I mean, anybody can make up anything now Crazy. and, it, and it, it'll pass. But no, <laughs> you know, just be smart, guys. Yeah, Follow the people wild. that cover the team that know about things. 
if it's too good to be true, it's probably not too good. To be, you know, it's not. It's it's yeah. just not. It, if you have to ask, is this person <laughs> legitimate? The answer is no. <laughs> right. Usually. Correct. Usually Correct. The answer is no. Correct. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, Ross, yeah, I, I want to. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I was, was just going to say I, I want to stick with this. Go for it. <laughs> I was just going to say I was going to mention real quick too that people have to also realize, re- remember, not realize, but remember too that like right now is when draft capital, in terms of draft capital versus veteran player, draft capital is at its lowest value, and so what you see is seventh round picks traded for Joe Mixon. You see sixth round mm-hmm. picks traded for Justin Fields. Like this is kind of when those day three picks for veteran players becomes a reality. And, and so that's another reason that you kind of look at it and go, ah, well, maybe this isn't the time to make a move for anything that's going to happen this year. Although yep. the Saints with four, four fifth round picks could be interesting, but then you're taking on a contract you didn't negotiate, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that in terms of like draft capital value and how it shifts and changes yep tons i mean and there's a team that might get needy and it you know you use the for those who you know look at the trading aspect it, it, everybody still goes off the jimmy johnson formula he assigned the value of those picks and so it's like you think oh well three fifth rounders will get you into x round reality is it's probably not and it depends on the team it depends on, on the what the situation and- is so many factors and in the draft day is just absolutely insane what i was bringing up here ross is is this is another one from john he says do you ever think mickey loomis will select a qb in the first round being that he hasn't selected one in over two decades well first i would say um it's not just a mickey thing it's it's a da thing it's a jeff ireland thing so it it doesn't fall on just one thing right Mm -hmm. um I, i again this keeps coming up the quarterback at 14, I don't see it. it. I just don't think it makes sense. No, I don't. I'm not an advocate of it. I don't think this is the year, given all the information with, you know, how they feel about Derek Carr or how they feel about certain areas. I just don't think so. And look, if they land a guy like pass, or, I mean, like uh, Chase Young, a pass rusher like him or somebody, then I think that takes defensive end off the table. I think interior would be a, a question that they could do or a wide receiver, a guy that they need as a possession guy. I mean, they've got a young room right now. Mm-hmm. They don't have a veteran presence at the moment. I mean, there's just so many other ways that he can go, but this is just not the year you take a quarterback. And I understand the sentiment and the arguments of, well, Aaron Rodgers sat on the bench or, you know, these other quarterbacks sit on the bench. The Saints don't look at it that way. That's yeah. just the cold, hard truth is they don't look at it this way. Yeah, sure. Quarterback would be interesting. And, you know, I think about Jeff Ireland's comments before at Senior Bowl. He kind of actually would prefer a, a dual threat quarterback, honestly, in a lot of ways. And so I think it's other things to think about is, is why some of these others may not make sense. Some may make more sense, but no quarterback. At 14, it's just not going to happen this year. Yeah. Just not. Yeah, it doesn't feel like that's going to be the case. And sorry, I want to correct something I said. I said that draft capital is at its lowest value. I meant to say draft capital is at its highest value relative to veteran players. That's why you see the lower draft picks traded for names and players that you wouldn't imagine they'd be traded for. So sorry, I wanted to, I wanted to clarify that. But yeah, no, I, I don't... Cool. I don't see the the quarterback in the first round thing being a thing this year. Um, the teams that are in desperate need of quarterbacks are going to outbid anything that the Saints would be able to do. And at 14, is that really where your positional value is? Is that really where you want to take a swing on somebody that isn't going to see the field in two years, three years? Or is that where you want to add talent to your room? Right. So that's what we were mentioning earlier about the position has to kind of go away. If it's the best player available on the board, Patrick Mahomes at 11 would have made sense. Right. No matter what. But if it's the best player on the board, that's one thing. But you don't reach for a player in the first round because of their position, nor do you pass on an elite player at a certain role based on their position. So if the right player falls, then maybe there's a conversation. But I don't think that you go and reach for you know, a, a lesser quarterback, the third, the, the fifth or sixth quarterback on the board because you want to <laughs> at 14, y- you're not going to do that. And so it just doesn't feel like at any point in the early portion of the draft, which is really the only place where it's a value for you to draft a quarterback nowadays. Uh, and the value of that is arguable based on the 2021 and 2022 draft classes at quarterback that we have all seen change teams at this point or not pan out. Like really the only one is Trevor Lawrence. And 
bah, you know, uh, where is that really? And so it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And you're not in a situation to where you are one of those teams that are, there are other teams that are way more needy than you are at that position. They're the ones that are going to move up to go and get that quarterback well before you're even on the board. Yeah. It's fascinating how quarterbacks, how quickly they go through quarterbacks now. I mean, maybe that guy's yeah, like a Lake Willis or, or yeah, exactly. A Mac Jones or something like, you know, you're fortunate if you can find a guy like a CJ Stroud or, you know, you get fortunate if you can find a Jalen Hurts or Justin Herbert or stuff. It's not the norm. That's the thing right. is it's not always the norm. And, and again, I, I just, it really is, it's just not, it, it just don't see the quarterback. I understand the, 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 the reasoning behind it, the thoughts behind it, but this just doesn't feel like that's where they're going. That doesn't feel like where the needs are at. And, Again, maybe they'll prove me wrong. Maybe they'll prove everybody wrong. But I just don't see at the podium when you have all these other needs available and, yeah, yeah. and that or you have to address. Quarterback's the one that you go with. I just don't see it. Yeah. Now, semantics on the, the financials, the salary cap, they've had a lot of them. So right now, as it stands, they're about $18.6 million with, of space that they have available right now. Now, some of those contracts probably haven't been hit yet. Not that I've seen, but, you know, they renegotiated James Hurst's contract. We, mm -hmm. we said that was happening. Ramcheck was another one who said that was happening as well. You know, I, I think they're positioned fairly well as far as having some money. You only need, what, 4 or $5 million to sign your draft class in the first yeah, place? Exactly. Yeah. So it's not like you have a ton. So they can create more space if they wanted to. You mentioned Taysom. You mentioned Kamara. It's possible for them to create more space, but I don't think they're in a situation where you look at the state of the team, they're hurting for money or they're in a press situation where they have to spend this or that or they want to make sure that they spend all their money. It really is just kind of a, a wait and see type thing for them, and and, and I, they'll they'll get some players out of it again. It's they got to get ninety. They're gonna get them somewhere, yeah, they right? They have to get them. It may not like, be the just... ones you want. <laughs> it's just one. Yeah. And of course, that could suggest whether they're they're in a, a, a compete now mode or a soft rebuild mode or a managing the cap mode. There's just too many yes. variables right the answer now. Is yes, across all. Yes, <laughs> yes is the answer. Yes is the correct answer. I, I saw this question here, Ross, too. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, Thomas Morstead became available or thought indicated a lot of people are like, oh, Thomas Morstead's going to come back. And he ended up going to the Jets, which that was kind of expected. But, you know, interesting question. Do you think that they'll keep Headley at punter and Groupie at kicker or move on from either of them? Um, Groupie, no, absolutely not. And Headley, they have a log logistical way of thinking of Lou Headley, but – what are your thoughts? And then I'll chime in and tell you what my thoughts are. Too. Yeah, it, it's a simple look for me. They'll bring in competition in training camp as they always do. I think you'll see two kickers, two punters on the roster, just like you're going to see two fullbacks on the roster, just like you always do and all these other things. I think they'll bring in competition, but overall the competition would be there to help kind of push the development of Groupie and Headley, kind of keep them in that sort of competitive spirit, keep them in all of that. But I, I don't expect that there will be a new team of specialists uh, in 2024 no. at this time. No. No, and I, I mean, Groupie did fine, you know, and, and I think here's the insight I give you, it's something we got from Phil Galliano at, and at the Senior Bowl, mm -hmm. which I think kind of put this in perspective a good bit for those who just don't know. Groupie basically went from his final kicking days at Notre Dame, or Notre Dame, Notre Dame. I, I was telling my kids about Hunchback in Notre Dame, that's why I was coming <laughs> up. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. <laughs> but he finishes up at Notre Dame. He goes immediately into kicking camps and all these types of things that he's working out on. And then he gets picked up as undrafted free agent. Then he's kicking for the Saints and he's in the thick of it. Then he's kicking during the season. This is the first point in I don't know how long for him that he's Who been able knows. to kind of have a break yeah. and not be able to kick. But like that's just a, a semblance to just try to it, paint the picture of a journey for somebody like a Blake Groupie. Yeah, and the so process I would is expect wild. Ton, I mean, it's crazy. You look up Cole's kicking camp and shout out to them that they have a lot of specialists that go specifically to them. And, you know, Groupie is one that when, when I saw him as pit, I was like, this guy's got a little bit more than meets the eye, if you will, to, to uh, rip off Transformers a little bit. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think that's just important to remember is that he's going to be able to have an actual offseason, rest himself up a little bit. And then with Lou Headley, again, it's an unorthodox, it's an Australian type rules to punt, but 
here's the thought process behind it. If you have a punter that can kick 55 yards and gets the great hang time and then is able to return 10 yards versus a punter who can punt it 45 with no return, the net is still the same, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way the team looks at it. Again, whether you like it or you don't, that's just the cold hard facts. It's like that's why one of the, the Saints were a top you know, unit in, in terms of, of their return yardage is because of that simple thing. It doesn't look good. It, it honestly is scary. Sometimes when he points the ball, we're like, mm, we're going to come in 40 to 45 maybe, but in a lot of ways, it sometimes it, it really does work. Right. Yeah. And I don't know. I, again, that's just the, the thought process there. I don't know if they'll, they'll change much of that because they've had the guys that can boot at 60, 65 yards. If they wanted that, they would have kept Blake Gilligan. They right. didn't. They they kept Headley on the roster, and so, and I think it was more not just because of of what the ability was. I think there were some other issues there, but um, without getting too much into it. But you know, I, I, they they like the undrafted guys. I think Darren Rizzi does a fantastic job that he mm-hmm. just doesn't get a lot of respect for in a lot of ways. But he just puts together a solid special teams group, and now he's really going to be tested because again, you lost a lot of these pieces and a special teams coverage unit and it's going to be having to, to make it, you know, make, make it a gold again. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just can't have any drop off in the special teams game at all. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. I, I was trying to look real quick to see if I could find the, uh, the punting stats for new Orleans. And so when we look at like, um, when we look at like return n- number of returns and things like that, like those are the other things that you're always looking for, but the saints were second, least amount of return yards in total allowed jacksonville was at 143 the saints were at 163 and so that was 163 over the course of 29 different returns and with the help of my trusty calculator here that's 5.6 yards per return like Hmm. that's the value that's why the saints like that right just like you were mentioning you can punt 55 yards and give up a you know 10 yard return it's a 45 net 45 you know net but if you're punting 45 yards with no return, it's the same thing, just like you mentioned. And when you're allowing 5.6 yards per return, like, yeah, your punt coverage unit's doing pretty well. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I want to get to a couple of these questions again. It, it's kind of been a common thing. We've talked about it, but kind of a two-parter, picking O-line or D-line at 14. And then this other one from Chad says, with major struggles on the offensive line, how do we fix it? We have five starters, but Penning's a disappointment. Do you sign a guy like Cody Whitehair and push McCoy McCoy to guard? Which, A, you don't push McCoy to guard. I don't see that at all. But, you know, again, the offensive line. good creativity. Like, good creativity. Yeah, it is. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, we've talked about it. This new offensive scheme doesn't work unless you have the offensive line to support it, right? Yep. It just doesn't. So, Given what we've seen so far, and there are tons of offensive linemen out there still available on the market. Trevor Penning, we we've we said it. He's not going to be swapping positions right now. He's mm-hmm. going to be the left tackle, which would I would be under the impression that James Hurst is going to be their left guard at this moment, present yeah. in time. The right side's going to be fine with Ramchek and Ruiz and McCoy. That left side is where I'd put more attention to potentially, yeah. and they'd like guys like Landon Young too. They really want to see what Nick Saldaveri is going to do this season. Mm -hmm. But, you know, given all the information and the fact that this Kubiak offense needs to work with a solid offensive line, what are you most concerned about it? And do they need to add a veteran like a Cody Whitehair? And trust me, there's tons of offensive linemen that are available right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think adding a veteran makes sense. I look at like Dalton Reisner, who's got experience in Minnesota, had experience in Denver, places that, you know, various members of this coaching staff have been similar systems, having worked with Kevin O'Connell, who also runs that wide zone system and stuff like that. So I think that like free agency is really the place to answer those questions. Do you go offensive line or go defensive line? The answer is yes, but you do it in free agency. You want the guys that have proven that they can do it at the NFL level. And, and yep. you know, uh, Dalton Reiser tweeted <clears throat> something the other day. And one of the things that stuck out to me was when he said that he earned a starting role with three different coaching staffs. I think that means something. I think there's value sure. in that and yeah. everything. And so uh, I, that's probably the way that I would go. And then in the draft, it depends on what you did in free agency. And then right. really like ideally what you're trying to do with a draft is just who's the number one player on your board. And again, position goes away. Who is the number one player on your board or not number one player on your board? Sorry. Who's the highest ranked player on your board 
when you're up to select, when you're up to pick. Uh, that's what I mean. And so I think that that becomes the biggest piece. I think with this year's class at offensive line and at defensive and on the defensive line, there's not a wrong answer, in my opinion. Like if you're drafting yeah. at 14 and you get Olu Fashanu out of Penn State or Troy Fatanu out of Washington or Jared Verse out of Florida State or Dallas Turner out of Alabama, it's yeses all around. Drazan Newton out of Illinois, yes. Like mm. that's the that's the kind of beauty of where the Saints are. And the fact that they're the runs are expected to happen at positions that are either A, deep, or B, the Saints don't really feel like they're going to be targeting quarterback as we mentioned you're going to see three four quarterbacks potentially go before the saints pick at 14 you'll probably see two or three offensive tackles go before the saints pick at 14 you might see an interior offensive lineman in troy fatano going you know before the saints pick and then you're seeing at least three wide receivers go so your 10 picks there are at positions where either offensive tackle is deep enough wide receiver you don't have to invest the first round pick in we see that year and year and year and year in and year out Quarterback's not on the, on the radar for them. An offensive line is deep. And so it's not a bad situation to be in. So I, I think that like that becomes a thing for me is who's the, be who's the best player on your board? That's who you select at 14. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I know it's not popular. And again, we believe, and we know that this team believes in building from the trenches within. And again, I, I just don't want to, to see it. You got to go with the guy that's going to, if that's your vision, you got to go with the guy who's going to be starting for you day one, right? You just can't yeah. go with the the project that, again, I've said it, beaten like a dead horse is, you know, the RAS scores off the charts and they're from this small school. You want somebody who's had the experience at the NFL level if you're going to trust a rookie to do it. And, again, I like that, con, you know, the, the concept of that. But, you know, there is a learning curve. There is a learning process. It's obviously not, you know, given to you, you know, the the, the – people that are the players that go in and start day one are few and far between just because you're drafted in the first round does not mean that you're going to be a starter on day one. Anything. And so, yeah. Yeah. And, and with John Bitten, look, he's a new offensive line coach. I like that. He's a guy that, you know, can give Trevor Penning the benefit of the doubt. And look with Trevor, they, they've said it, look, it's, it's one of those that he just hasn't had an off season. He hasn't had this. And, and I'm not saying that they've made excuses for him, but they have been patient with Trevor and they feel like, Trevor can play in any offensive system that they have. They just don't feel like they've done him any favors. Right. And so that's the real thing. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And with Benton, you know, he's a guy that's been around a long time. And so can he get him where he needs to be? Uh, hopefully, because he's at a, a, a pivotal year, he's got to come in and produce. And I think there are elements to his game, which are, are really good. I think his run blocking, is very good. And I think that's where it can come in handy with a, a Clint Kubiak system for sure. Right. His pass pro is where he's got to get better. That was the case last year. His pass pro is just not where it needs to be. And he understands where it is. It's just something he's got to, to overcome. And, and his, is his feet, his hand placement, all the things, the anticipation of the rush, all those types of things is where he needs to get better at. And so, you know, he's got to, to show it. And he's it's one of those players that, if he doesn't get a starting role, then yeah, you know, that's probably bust potential because this is a guy who shouldn't be your jumbo tackle. He shouldn't nope. be your, I mean, he should be your Which starting. They didn't even put he him in for that player. last year. <laughs> Right. They went to a practice squad guy, Tommy Kramer, right. which no respect. Tommy Kramer has been around too, but mm -hmm. that's just not a good look. Right. And because they wanted to get him reps when they were in a situation where they had the game in hand. And unfortunately the team didn't have many of those games in hand for, for last year. So. Right. Yeah. Not a lot <laughs> oh, of opportunity man. there. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing that's a, that like we, we kept asking about last year is kept hearing them say, you know, he's got to get more reps. He's got to get more reps. He's got to get more reps and everything. And it's like, okay. And, and, and they were specifically talking about reps, like live bullet situations. So like actually like in game, so it was like, okay, well, how does he get those reps? If you don't, if you don't, Put him on the field and everything and like we asked yeah. that question and and there was one time where da was like look yeah you're right you know what i mean and like i feel like there is something like i love that you mentioned sort of the accountability of the organization kind of going like yeah we didn't really do him any favors you know what i mean it's over like that so I, I i'm i'm interested to see how it all pans out um and and when i mentioned like going best player available in in the first round i think that's requiring that you handle these positions in free agency but if they land chase young and then don't 
land anybody at offensive tackle or anybody on the offensive line to compete to fill in whatever then maybe that becomes the 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 spot that gets addressed at 14 or whatever so like these things can all can all change but i do agree and i i'm happy that you highlighted that about the saints sort of looking at it and going hey we didn't really do him any favors either right like patience has to be such a big part of what's going on here and maybe that's where the new coaching staff can come in and help out a bit yeah i mean you've just got to get it right you just do i mean you just can't can't afford to have another draft pick that you've drafted in the first round that just busts out. Right. I just, yeah. you can't do it. I think Brazil was an exception. He did out, outstanding for them last year, but you know, Alave is obviously another one, but even Alave had his, his slump in the middle of the season last year too. And I mean, you know, this is a, a hard thing for these first round picks too. And I'm not saying let's get the fiddle out and just start a violin out and start playing a little melody uh, and stuff. But I mean, it is a lot of pressure to produce. I mean, you're expected to come produce so many of these first round picks. I mean, you look at the past five years, they just haven't panned out a lot of them. I'm not talking about saints. I'm just talking about in general, in the NFL, yeah, yeah. right? There's just too many of them that just don't. And so again, it's a, it's a critical stage for this team and they've got to get some things right. And again, after right now, it's March. We haven't seen a game play. They haven't played any football. There's still players that they've got to sign. They still have to go through the draft. And even when they get pads on or stuff, you know, you, you can't put too much stock in training camp in some aspects because we've seen players do well in training camp and then they just don't, for whatever reason, put it on preseason film or they just don't do what they're supposed to in some aspects. And so I guess you can't, I'm not saying take it with a grain of salt, but what matters is who's on the roster in September and who's playing and how they perform. I mean, yep. I just don't know how else to, to put that. Um, look, as we're winding down here, uh, DJ asked about the, the fifth round picks. We have four fifth round picks right now, three comps and then one fifth round pick, but he talks about the guys in the past that did work out. So the last two were um, uh, Jordan Howden mm -hmm. and DeMarco Jackson. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. I, I think Howden for sure. Howden, they, they nailed that evaluation, I feel yeah. like, for sure. Now, before those guys, they didn't have a lot of fifth-round picks. I think the last one was 2019. I wouldn't go too far in the fifth-round picks for the Saints because they yeah. have some pretty ugly history there in the fifth round. Now, that's in the past. Mm -hmm. Take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, it's an entirely different. Like by by the time we get back to the next fifth round picks that were utilized, we have to go to Tyler Davison. Hey, who I, like had a pretty steady career, actually. Uh, I had and Dame, too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Davis Toll and Damian Swan all the way back in 2015. So it's been a minute yeah. uh, with the exception of the last couple of years, as you mentioned, Jordan Howden and, and DeMarco Jackson. So by then you're looking at like an entirely different scouting staff has had changes since then. You've had changes at general managers since uh, like assistant general managers and all that with Terry Fontenot leaving, although he doesn't really do much for the draft, didn't really do much for the draft, but you know, you've had so much change over there. It's an entirely new coaching staff. It's an entirely new system now and all those other things. So um, that's, that to me is, uh, but if you look more recently, I think, you know, Jordan Howden in particular was a guy that obviously was a success at that, at that spot. Yeah, and I don't want to say the draft is a crapshoot, but in some aspects, I mean, it is. <laughs> it I mean, is. Gonna, you could say it's a crapshoot, like it really is. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, and right now you're going to have these pro days and some of these players who didn't work out at, at their the combine or the senior bowl, now they're going to do it at the pro day. I mean, guys, Zach Wilson looked amazing at his pro day. And I mean, he made this one throw is like back across his body, like something crazy. And everybody's like, um, this guy is going to be legitimate uh, newsflash. He wasn't obviously no. you see that, but I mean, it, it's pro days are one thing. And I, I've said this and I'm a proponent of it. What you've done out there is on film. Yeah. The, 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 the team needs to know who you are, what you're about and you know, what, what you're going to, are you going to fit the team? I think those yeah. are the biggest questions they want to see answered, but you know, some of those things, like if you run a faster 40 than what you maybe thought, I think that helps if you do a better three cone or have a higher vert in some of these. I think some of that stuff obviously helps, but yeah. I don't think I'm drafting somebody based off of how high they can jump in some aspects. No. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like no. some of these are just crazy no. in some of the, the way they, they evaluate. And I'm not saying that it's a shot at the combine and what it stands for. It's just, I think you see where players have put their film out and that's what speaks a lot for these because the scouting staffs like the saints they've been doing this all year and they've been doing it for years, right? It's not like they're with the team and stuff. They're area scouts that are doing their, their homework on these 
prospects. And then the Saints coaching staff and front office doesn't get involved until February. I mean, this right. they're they're literally barely a month and a half into this, right? Yeah. And so there's yeah. a lot of information they gotta get now. Yeah, and that coaching staff isn't I mean, sorry, my apologies. That scouting staff hasn't yeah. just been focused on the 2024 draft class during the 2023 season. Like they've been following all these guys for a long time in a lot of cases and stuff. And so, you know, it's just, it, it's a lot of, of just kind of like watching guys progress. And that's one of the things that I would really encourage people to look at too, is not just numbers and stats and things like that, but like, do these collegiate prospects get better every year? Is there a, is there a trajectory of improvement and maturity in terms of, in terms of on-field production year over year over year? That's something that a lot of these scouts will pay attention to is, did you have a dip? your senior year, your junior year, and how did you respond to that your senior year if you did have it your junior year and all these other things. Like you want to see the right trajectory going in. So it's a lot of evaluation that's beyond, that's way, way, way beyond what happened in Indianapolis and what happened in 2023. It's going back, back, back. <laughs> yep, exactly. All right, Ross, we're wrapping up. I want to get a couple of these questions. We can just do rapid that's fire, it. whatever you want to do. But uh, first one, do you think Saints will go defense in the later rounds, being that they need D-line help? And DB help to shore up the defense. Yeah, I think so. And I think you're you're looking at those positions too because they help on special teams as well. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, you just need to have defensive linemen. And look, here's the other part I'll say about those positions. And again, we forget you got the UFL that's going to complete in, in a few right. months. You're going to get players out of that too. They're going to find some undrafted guys. I think, you know, everybody gets so wrapped up in the draft picks. This team has had some pretty good undrafted guys over the years. I think that's something that they might lean on a little bit more this yeah. year, especially if they're not filling out some of these needs. So, so they did in 2017. So they did in yeah. 2017. They signed Larry Warford, and then they signed – who was the defensive ta the defensive player that they signed that year too? Uh, they had another – like one other them. like solid – say again? I said they had a couple. I'm trying to think who you should Yeah, yeah. it was right like now. Larry Warford and then one other signing that like helped them out. And then outside of that, like it was a lot of – mid-level free agents and then what they did was that they got really really lucky in the draft and did mm -hmm. really really well in the draft and then that ended up changing everything but then they also had a really busy undrafted free agency that year too that was the like Traven Durrell and Devaro Lawrence and like all those guys that came in and you know ended up bringing in draft picks for them because they traded some of those guys away and stuff like that like that's got to be a big part of it like the entire offseason is a part about it, it is about getting your team better and improving your team not just the first week of free agency Yep, absolutely. Uh, let's see another one. Who's the Saints looking at at 14? Edge, offensive tackle, tight end, top needs. If you were to have to pick right now, mm -hmm. what would you take? Edge. Yeah, I, I edge is probably my top thought. I, I think interior, defensive interior, if your guy's there, possibly. I'd and put I that well ahead end. of tight end. I would put that well ahead yes. of tight end, for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, say. definitely. Tight end's nice. It's a luxury, for sure, but... Again, I, I think it's more of a luxury at this point. I, I really wish they could get somebody like a, a George Kittle type stuff, somebody or Travis Kelsey. It just, it just, it's it's tough. It's tough to get somebody like that. I mean, we'll see how this offensive scheme works out too, because maybe they'll yeah. they'll have a little bit more in there, and maybe they can unlock a little bit more Juwan Johnson. I'm excited about uh, Clancy Barone doing that again. Yeah. Let's see. Seems like our whole wide receiver group is all speed guys. Do we go after a guy like a Tyler Boyd? I yeah, do like I Tyler do, I'm writing about him. I do like yeah. Tyler Boyd for sure. I th I was really high on KJ Osborne too until he just signed today. That was kind of a little bit crushing. Yeah. I thought he'd make a lot of sense. Um, another one to give up. What about a Michael Gallup? Just got released. Yeah, by that would be. A, that, got some issues. Yeah, that would be a big one though. I mean, like that would be that would be a nice signing for them. Um, I would rather if if I were to like power rank it, I would put Michael Gallup above Mike Williams. Yeah. No, I agree there. Popular opinion, but I would put that up, put no. up there. But I, Mike but Williams I also, got some problems. He's yeah, he hadn't been able to stay healthy. His injury history, the Saints injury history. I don't know why I would put those two <laughs> things together. And then, like for me though, like At Perry, I don't consider just the speed guy. I think his, you know, he is a possession receiver. Like he's a guy that could do that. And then Cedric Wilson, who they just added, I think probably plays a little bit more of a slot role, but could be a possession guy for you from the slot without being much of a speed guy too. So I, I would put both of them in a category of not above, but in a category outside of simply speed. Yep. But they're hey, far from uh, done at that position. Far from done at that position. Yeah, absolutely. Your guy's getting some love to one of your favorites, Theo Johnson. Theo oh for gosh. tight end. 
Oh my gosh. Did it just <laughs> did it just get hot in here? All oh, the vapors. Yeah. Plus my pearls. Ooh, I listen, yes. the, you you like y- y- y'all can have the Brock Bowers party all you want. Theo Johnson in the fourth, if it, like trade up to for Theo Johnson in the fourth round out of Penn State. Um I'm I'm ready. I'm ready for that. Yep. Man. Ross, this time flies by. We've already almost, know. you know, How hour and 15. An hour and I don't know. 15, I don't crazy. know. I don't know. I feel like we could keep going and talking, oh but God. of course, respectfully, you've got a, a life. I've got a life too. And guys, I mean. And y'all have look, a life. What are you doing? doing? <laughs> no, y'all have a life. Yeah. You listen to St. Football. It's like Patty's Day. Shouldn't you be with a pint of Guinness or something? Or a or something I, like I that? Think, I, I think my good friends at uh, at SC, at uh, SCM over at St. City Me are sitting with a pint of Guinness. Check this out. Probably. Yeah. I would say. Shout out to them. Thank That's you my, for support that, too. Those are, my, those are the guys. Yes. Yes. Well, Ross, as always, What's coming on on uh, for Locked On, or what's coming up on Locked On? Oh, John. Maybe I can you, English a little bit. You what's know. coming up on Locked In, and what you are uh, working on these days? Oh, it's mock draft season, baby. We threw the first. We threw the first. We threw the first wave of free agency. You know, we got to do a mock draft, John. No, we we are going to do that. We are going to do that. But I also want to dive a little bit deeper to into the decision of not making the move for. Uh, making a move for Justin Fields. So I want to dive into that a little bit more. I want to write something on that over at Saints News Network as well. So just, you know, continuing to keep everybody up to date on what's going on with the Saints and then, you know, giving you uh, kind of breakdowns and stuff like that. We're doing film study over with the insider programs and stuff like that too. So just a lot of work, not a lot of like, not work, I'm sorry, but like a lot of like material, like a lot of content on the way, just because th- there's so much that does go on, even though, even when the free agency period feels so light, we'll be handling all that. What about you, bud? Well, I've got something coming out in the morning. It's actually so one of the things that, um, yeah, it's uh, talking about what would make the Saints free agency period a lot more exciting. So I've got a whole bunch of targets on different sides of the ball, some offensive guys, some defensive guys, some wild cards, some things that the team could do that maybe would make a lot of sense. And so some of the guys we've talked about tonight and some of the guys we haven't talked about. So check that out on Saints News Network. We've got tons of stuff coming. It's a fun time. Um, Hopefully it gets more fun over the next couple of weeks and uh, we'll have more to talk about next week. You know, maybe it'll be Chase Young signing or somebody else. Who we'll knows? See. We'll see. As long as it's probably not Nathan Peterman signing again, I guess maybe it will be okay. But I no, I'm not trying to take shots at Nathan Peterman. Guys, I'm sorry. It's just, you know, again, it's just been it's the reception the most, of the Saints. It's things. not the most inspiring yeah, signing when you sign a backup quarterback, no matter who that I backup get quarterback it. is. I get but it. Because it probably is. says... Yeah, everybody says, well, why didn't you just keep Jameis? And when we didn't even mention earlier, Jameis is going to be able to start in Cleveland. I yeah, guarantee probably. you he's going he's to getting, start. He's getting some time over there. Guarantee you he'll start. <laughs> I don't know when, but I, I I don't know. It'd be something if he beats out Deshaun in training camp too, but mm-hmm. we'll see. But at any rate, guys, we appreciate you tuning in. As always, really thank you for, for choosing Second and Saints. And look, we love – all of our fans, all Saints fans, passionate, most passionate fan base out there that knows what they're talking about yes. for sure. And so, man, we uh, are just so thankful for you guys and continuing to just hit that like and subscribe button, promote us. Look, Ross, I saw something that <laughs> we're like number two in Slovakia and all these different countries. Let's I go. don't know how of a podcast and Let's stuff, go. but it was like that. France and Ireland and stuff. I'm like, man, we're going to have to go on world tour and visit some of these countries. And I don't know. I mean, if you're yeah. from there, let us know. We'll, we'll travel, I guess. Maybe. Holler at us. Holler at us. <laughs> holla, holla, holla. <laughs> holla, 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 holla. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for this episode of Second and Saints. Guys, again, if you can't check us out live, the podcast is up as well. It'll be up there soon enough. And then all the replays will be available on our YouTube channel. And then all of the stuff gets cut up too in chapters. It'll be on Saints News Network and such. So check Ross out on Locked On Saints and the Locked On Network, all the great work they do. You can follow all our written work at Saints News Network. And then I do also video work for Boot Crew Media. Be sure to give us some love. Hot season for the Pels. I'm wearing my, oh, yeah. my Pelican shirt. Just oh, so yeah. they're they're making a run. I, let's let's do it, Pels. Let's go. <laughs> So flock up there. Guys, appreciate y'all. Thanks and have a good night.